I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce the next cancer that we're going to discuss with my guest, Cindy Lovelace, because it is a mouthful. Neuroendocrine? You are very good at that. that. Okay. Yes. That's we, close. But that is why we call it NET for short. NET cancer. NET cancer, All yes. All right. And Cindy, you started the Healing NET Foundation out because of your personal journey, and I know we could talk the entire segment about that, but Tell me a little bit about your journey to get to this place, to start this organization. Sure. Well, I was already a breast cancer survivor at the time that I was diagnosed with neuroendocrine. And my tumor was found incidentally. Um, it was kind of, a, kind of a providential situation. I um, had uh, developed blood clots because of a reaction to a drug that I was taking uh, with my uh, breast cancer therapy. And as a result of that, uh, the blood clots, I went to the ER and when I was diagnosed diagnosed and they did a scan of my lungs, um, the technician just happened to note down in the lower corner of my scan that they saw a shadow. I followed up with my oncologist and several months later um, they actually diagnosed a neuroendocrine tumor and they did this through an endoscopic ultrasound and it was found in the tip of my pancreas. My. It was pretty um, uh, amazing that they even found the tumor. You had no symptoms. I had no symptoms whatsoever. And s as a result of that, um, I assumed there would be a protocol for mm -hmm. neuroendocrine cancer. And what I found out from my oncologist is not only was there a sta not a standard protocol, but she actually didn't know very much about the cancer because it was considered so rare. And um, I had it resected, mm -hmm. had a really great surgeon, and I was doing well, and then uh, in late 2011, I was uh, watching CNN News with my husband, and the story came on that Steve Jobs had passed away. And Dr. Gupta with CNN mm -hmm. uh, went through this whole process of explaining that Steve Jobs had neuroendocrine cancer. And you and were floored. I was floored. I was shocked. I Googled it again, not like I didn't before. Mm -hmm. uh, but this time, um, the first person to come up in my search was a doctor at Vanderbilt, Dr. Eric Liu. And he had started a neuroendocrine center. And I couldn't believe it. And I said, what? There's a doctor right here in Nashville, Tennessee that knows about neuroendocrine. Turns out he and my oncologist were good friends, but she didn't understand what he was doing, that he was a surgeon that did neuroendocrine. And so um, that was the, the odd, you know, six degrees of separation there mm -hmm. of, of not, you know, having that connection to know that there was an expert in the disease. And so when I went to see Dr. Liu, he was able to explain to me so much about the disease and um, had also trained in Sweden and had started the clinical trial at Vanderbilt for the first gallium 68 scan in the United States. And, and that's this, how they're tracking them? Yeah, well, the this is a are... new diagnostic tool. It was, um, this was in 2011. It's okay. now been approved by the FDA in 2016 and it tends to light up these tumors that other scans miss. In my case, um, I had had an MRI on my liver, which showed that it was clear, but when I took the gallium 68 scan, two tumors lit up on my liver. And so I never would have realized this had it not been for that mm -hmm. diagnostic treatment. So what was the next step then? What was your treatment after those tumors lit up? What did they do? Um, I did have one resected. The others are watched. Um, one of the things that we've learned about neuroendocrine cancer is that, you know, it tends to be a lifelong management of this disease. Um, you can resect, but the tumors have a tendency to pop up in other places or more tend to grow in the area. And so now I'm in a watch and wait. I do take a uh, medication once a month that will help slow the growth down even more. They're slow growing tumors, which is a good thing, but also because they're slow growing and can be so tiny mm -hmm. to start, they're hard to detect. And people are often misdiagnosed, you said. They are, um, and the misdiagnosis comes in more with people who are symptomatic. Now, I had no symptoms of the disease, mm -hmm. but people who are symptomatic have really uh, life-altering symptoms. They have chronic diarrhea. Uh, they may have flushing, where you know they feel really hot and their face turns red. Um, they may have um, a pain, an unexplained pain. They may have some wheezing um, that you know could be attributed to asthma. So a lot of people are misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease or IBS or IBD, and the average time for correct diagnosis, unfortunately, is about five to six years oh my goodness. because people are trying other medications to try to solve those symptoms. 
With all these digestive related, almost bowel related intestinal, is that where a lot of the tumors live? Yes, um, so this is a cancer of your hormone producing cells. And um, the majority of your hormone producing cells tend to be in what is called your gut your region, gut. your digestive mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And so typically the pancreas, the stomach, um, your small and large intestines, your mesentery, um, and then uh, can also metastasize to the liver as in, in my case. But then there's also patients who have these in their lungs. And um, that, that's where they, you get into the wheezing symptoms and, and difficulty in breathing, that sort of thing. Do many of them start in the lungs or metastasize to the lungs? Some primaries can be in the lung, yes. Can, primaries mm -hmm. can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. About how many new cases are there? Since it is still considered rare, how many cases do they see? Do you see a year? Well, there is some uh, concern that they may not be all that rare because the ah. incidence is rising. Uh, the latest study shows that about seven in 100 thousand cases, about 171,000 people in the United States uh, diagnosed with the disease. Um, but what we're concerned about, at, particularly at the Healy Net Foundation, is because um, so many physicians are not aware of, uh, don't think about neuroendocrine tumors when they have a patient mm -hmm. who is you know, showing all these different symptoms or when even when a tumor is found incidentally. So they may, may not be aware. So there's a lot of people that we feel fall through the cracks and don't get properly diagnosed. Well, we're so glad that, that you are here to share this with us, that you're doing so well, and glad there's the Healing Net Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching Community Health Matters.